Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian. I'm here with Felix. Today, we're speaking with Niklas Kunkel. He's the founder of Chronicle. Chronicle is an Oracle protocol providing data for blockchain applications. And it's also a spin out of the Maker protocol. So uh, Niklas and his team were, were uh, basically heading the Oracle team at Maker and, Chron and that that team has now spun out uh, to form Chronicle uh, as a standalone product. So we'll be diving into Chronicle today, understanding how it works, and also talking about the Oracle market more broadly. Nicholas, thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. So you've been in the space for, for some time. Obviously, you were uh, part of the Maker team and uh, heading the, uh, the Oracle team there. Uh, how did you get involved with Ethereum and uh, how did you start working with the Maker team? Actually, quite funny. I was at, uh, I was at IBM at the, in the research department and uh, we were actually working on Hyperledger, which was this uh, permissioned uh, ledger. And then the- Future Ethereum, of blockchains. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was the future. Uh, uh, effectively, IBM had missed the boat on cloud completely. They were very upset. Um, and they said the next thing that comes along, like we're going big and we're going early and, uh, you know, to their credit, you know, they were very, very early on blockchain. Mm -hmm. They just got the, the public private ledger, uh, kind of equation wrong. And, and so the Ethereum white paper kind of came out and I read this and I was like, oh wait, like, you know, public general compute layer, that's the thing. You know, I, I go to my boss, I'm like, all right, you know, we should. We should just throw away everything we did, right? We should just use this Ethereum stuff. And they're like, no, that's just vaporware. Um, I think somewhere like, uh, I think like a year later, like uh, mainnet actually launches and we're like, I'm like, look, it's real. Like, let's go. Like, um, and I was quickly told, you know, shut up, get in line, right? Uh, so so I, I made my way over to the Ethereum community and uh, uh, while, while like the community was great, there were not actually that many like real let's let's say like protocols to uh to, to work and contribute to there was a lot of kind of like hobbyist stuff going on but uh and with with grand ideals but not a lot of people just working full-time on on building something um and I, I think back then there were kind of like the three big teams were like uh i think auger digix dow and uh and maker um and so out of those uh I, I, I kind of chose Maker because uh, it just seemed like uh, a circle of like these individuals where I felt like the uh, the dumbest person in the room, and that always seemed like a very uh, a very productive environment for uh, for learning. Yeah, that's super interesting. I think also like interesting to hear like these three teams essentially all DeFi applications, if if you want to say it like that, right? Like Digix Star was about tokenizing gold, so kind of interesting that the 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 early teams were already working on like, I guess what became the, the biggest use case. Sure. I mean, if you think about what Digix style was, I think it was just a matter of like, you know, wrong, wrong timing, right? Uh, it, it, today, like a Digix style would, would be an RWA, right? Uh, a token that is like a stable coin backed by a gram of, you know, physical gold in the real world. Like that's a real world asset. Um, you've brought gold onto the blockchain, right? That would be uh, that would be huge in the the RWA narrative right now, right? Right. So also like of these three, yeah, I guess like you said, the timing was wrong there, maybe, and also like Augur, uh, sort of the prediction market thing didn't turn out like that well, let's say, or uh, it's still like sort of it's kind of still around, I guess, more so than um, with with poly market maybe. But also, I guess, yeah, Maker definitely is the most successful out of the stream, maybe because of you also. But yeah, <laughs> or maybe can you tell us a little bit about what, about the early days at Maker and sort of, yeah, what was so special about it? Yeah, I mean, in the early days of Maker, like, there was nothing, right? Uh, there were there were no DEXs. Like, this was way before an Ether Delta or anything. So we were like, well, we want to make DAI. But in order to make DAI, we have to build all this other stuff first, right? Um, so we made the first DEX. Um, there were no oracles. So, you know, conceptually they existed, but no one had actually made like a, 
like an Oracle protocol that anyone could use. No one was planning to make one. Uh, so we made the first Oracle. Uh, we deployed that in, I want to say June of 2017, uh, in conjunction with like the, the prototype for, for Psy, I think it was called a uh, proto Psy. And, uh, you know, that, that protocol, I mean, uh, one was like the first oracles on Ethereum. But two, if you think about how long that that was running, I mean, uh, it's, it's been running consistently since then, right? And uh, like six years at this point on Ethereum, I mean, that makes it one of like the oldest kind of almost like a grandfather-like protocol, if you will. So we're, we're, we're quite proud to have built something that, uh, that really lasted and like withstood the, the test of time. What were the early visions for Maker and what were they trying to achieve at the time? And, you know, contrast that with what Maker has become now, like how, how different has that vision played out? Sure. So, so I think, um, with any kind of, um, startup with a, with a grand vision, you always have to make kind of adjustments over time. Right, like a, you, you have to imagine, right? When the idea for Maker was conceived, when the Maker white paper came out, there was no DeFi. The thing that I give, like you know, Runa and, and Nikolai, the the two co-founders of uh, of MakerDAO, so much credit for, is that uh, to them it wasn't like a a possibility that this like vibrant DeFi ecosystem would exist, right? It was a certainty, and they were building you know, for this like puzzle piece in that uh, certain future that they envisioned, right? And, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I think founders always have kind of visions of the future, but like, you know, Runa and, and Nikolai were really acute and uh, really kind of got it right. But, but even, you know, within, w w within that, right, uh, you can say, okay, well, in the future, there's this vibrant DeFi ecosystem. There's going to need to be some way to transact value that is stable, right? Because people don't want to transact in something that's volatile, right? Like if you're a merchant, you don't want to accept something that's volatile, right? Um, you have thin margins. Uh, if you don't have, if you don't get paid in something stable, your margins blow up, right? And uh, you don't have a sustainable business, right? As a customer, you don't want to hold anything volatile, right? Because you don't want to see your wallet, your wallet like a uh, value like fluctuate, right? You want to have like a stable purchasing power. So I think the the need for a for a stable coin was quite clear from a theoretical perspective. Um, but it what you know, I I, I think there were kind of uh, this idea that uh, the consumer side of using crypto, right? Like in their everyday lives, right? For, for spending and, and for earning, uh, that that would kind of keep in pace with the more, uh, let's say financial infrastructure, right? And I, I, I think as we've seen the, the past couple of years, while there has been consumer adoption of crypto, DeFi has just like outscaled uh, that type of adoption massively. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the, the, um... I think that the role of maker in early DeFi, I think a lot of people who maybe are using DeFi now, it's sort of like, you know, it, it, it I don't want to say it's forgotten, but like, because, um, stable cores are such an important part of, of DeFi and, and obviously you have USDC has taken up the larger part of the market. Um, it, it's, uh, something I think it's worth remembering that in the beginning when we didn't have USDC, like we, we had DAI and DAI was the only real um way to get stability like to get get out of risk assets uh in uh, uh in, in early DeFi and it played like a tremendously important role so i think it's like a, a very important public good and and also something that allowed DeFi to basically be spawned into existence i kind of think like the inflection point what really hit for me was that uh you know in back in uh in 2017 right when we when we released Psy, um, the moment after we released it, uh, Maker internally started paying everybody in Psy. Um, and it, it wasn't like planned that way beforehand. It was just kind of like, well, like, 
you know, if, if we, if we actually built what we said we built, you know, if we actually like believe that like it works, like you wouldn't mind being, being paid in it. Right. And, uh, I, I remember, uh, Andy, Andy Millenius, who was the CTO at the time, just being like, okay, we're going to start paying everybody inside. Everyone was kind of like shrug. Okay. And that's really cool. Right. That's when you go from like theoretical product, you know, with like, oh, it's going to be used in the future for all of this stuff to like, no, you're like using it yourself, right? Uh, you you have so much confidence in this thing you built, right? That you're willing to, you know, kind of like stake your your livelihood on it. Um, and uh, and and you know that continues today. Like even at Chronicle, like we we still pay our team and die. Um, even at Maker, teams are still paid and die. Like it's uh, you know there's a lot of teams across crypto, right? Uh, that uh, get paid and die or are willing to accept payment and die. You know, we work with auditors more like, can we pay you and die? And they're like, yeah, no problem. Right. So it's a, it's, it's, it's really beautiful that there's like, um, really the generalized like economy built, built around the whole thing. I think, yeah, that's really cool. It's also like something that you see in the like maker community in general, I guess where we were noticing that it's often seen as like one of these most like decentralized or like pushing for decentralization in a lot of ways. I guess Dai being like the most decentralized stablecoin, arguably maybe to this day, and and that being used there is also a sign of that. But maybe you can also like expand, you know, how how else this is like taking shape in in like sort of the spirit of of people working on Maker and and how it led you essentially to I guess also like now become Chronicle and your own uh, spin out from Maker. Sure. I, I mean, so from the beginning in Maker, um, there was always this focus on on quality, on doing something right, you know. And uh, you can, I, I think, there's like this uh, this this trade off, right, in the development space, where you know you can do something fast, you can do something cheap, uh, or you can do something with very high quality, right, and like choose two. And I, I think Maker was very much always maxing out on uh, you know doing something at a very high quality right regardless of of how much time it took right and uh, I, I I think we got a lot of pushback at the time right for for being very slow to release things but I think uh, um, our vision was always you know that DeFi would scale to the billions the tens of billions to the hundreds of billions so you know, when we were thinking about like the financial mechanisms and uh, and backing for Dai, right? Uh, that was always the standard to to what we were building to, right? and and I think that was uh, that was very prescient. So I think like that ethos. Um, you know, at, at this point, we've kind of had like generations of of de- like core developers at Maker, right? Uh, there's just been like several several different uh, different kind of waves of of people, but I think that. That attitude towards this, um, I w- like, like we kind of like to call it like maker grade. Um, I, I think that attitude towards doing something right, you know, um, that that kind of has really prevailed, um, especially when you see like um, all of the the ex developers of MakerDAO right to uh, uh, branching off, you know, to start their own uh, their own projects, right? You know, you see it with. Uh, with uh, the Ashna guys, you see it with the uh, the summer uh, Phi guys, right? You see it with uh, with Sense. Um, you know, I, I I think that prevailing attitude of of kind of like maker grade has really like pollinated to to those projects as well. And uh, Chronicle is definitely definitely among uh, counts that among like one of our values internally as well. Let's talk about Chronicle more specifically. Why? Did you guys uh, choose to spin out uh, the the Oracle from uh, from from Maker as as a different product? And we were we were talking about this before the show, uh, Felix and I. And I I think this isn't the first. Like I, I feel like Pyth also spun out of some project. I know that in Cosmos, like there's this Umi protocol, which is lending protocol. They're spinning out their Oracle as well as a product. Is this a trend, or is, or are we like, is there like a Oracle spin out trend happening here, or? Well, so so in in terms of our journey out of Maker, I, I think it was like a very like natural and organic uh, transition, 
right? Uh, you know, Maker um, really took this path of, you know, gradual decentralization, right? It, it did have, you know, a foundation at one point, right, that helped bootstrap the protocol. And then the foundation said, and now our mission is done. And they really handed over um, the entire protocol, right, to the DAO. And, and Maker is actually like a, a true DAO now, right? Like, there's governance votes to onboard teams, to give teams budget, right? To approve or, or reject like different projects. Like it's truly decentralized in, in every way. Um, and, and so that, that kind of transition into the DAO, I think was, uh, was, was very, um, was, was like a big milestone for, for DeFi in general, right? You kind of saw people have DAOs, but they were always backed by these foundations that were kind of like, uh, kind of like uh, shepherding the, the the DAO in a certain direction, right? And uh, Maker was the one to truly like, you know, like go of the wheel and uh, let the DAO kind of lead itself. Um, and 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 they should be commended for that. Uh, but I think the the problem that uh, that we kind of ran into is that the DAO was trying to do too much, and it kind of. Uh, was pulled in too many different directions, and so uh, that's kind of what the the end game uh, was all about. It was about uh, simplifying um, the DAO, right? Narrowing its scope, right? And and targeting it more towards like a smaller set of objectives. Um, and and this led to like a very natural kind of like spin out of of protocols from Maker, right? You see uh, like Spark Protocol developed by Phoenix Labs, right? And uh, Chronicle on the Oracle front. Um, so there was a, so there's, there's still like a very, very close uh, partnership with Maker, right? But these are these are independent entities, right? Um, and they they kind of just like count themselves like among like this, this Maker ecosystem. I'm also just like a partner to, uh, to, to Maker. Um, but they are independent, right? They have their own independent set of objectives. And I think, you know, from an Oracle protocol perspective, like it's great that you can, that you can have a partner like Maker where you can prove, you know, this infrastructure, this Oracle infrastructure, right, is rock solid, right? It's, um, it's secured, you know, uh, during the bull market, like Maker had, I think around 20 billion TVL, you know, like th this Oracle infrastructure is like really battle tested, right? Um, and then to use that, right, to bootstrap your credibility, right, to go and uh, bring this oracle to to everyone, right. I, I think I think there's a very uh, there's a very natural kind of like uh, product market fit and and transition there. Yeah, we definitely want to talk a bit about that. Like you know your plans of expanding sort of from being the partner for Maker to like onboarding other protocols. But I think initially, um, let's maybe talk about technically oracles in general, you know, and you maybe explain a little bit first what the role of the oracle actually is in Maker, maybe for listeners that, that ha because we're like now we're talking 20 minutes, we're just assuming everyone knows, maybe a lot of people know, but maybe just to refresh the memory, we go uh, like that and, and you explain the role of the oracle in Maker and and yeah, we, we sort of dive a bit into the tech. Sure. Um, so in Maker and, you know, uh, in general in DeFi, right? Oracles are kind of used as the like canonical source of truth, right? For for any kind of data, right? Um, and and that can be you know that that's usually like expressed in terms of like prices. Uh, so in Maker, right? Uh, if you um, lock up some ETH to um, open up a Dai position against, right? The protocol needs to know what the value of ETH is, right? In order to you know, decide how much die are you allowed to uh, to uh, to borrow, right? Um, it needs to know what the price of ETH is, right, in order to determine which loans are you know at risk of liquidation, right? So, um, oracles are kind of like um, like this critical infrastructure. Like you can almost think of them as like the Achilles heel of a of a protocol, because if an oracle ever prints, you know, ETH is zero. Or if an oracle ever prints like ETH is a hundred trillion dollars, right? Um, in in you know a second, the protocol pretty much blows up and goes insolvent, right? So they're um, they're really like this mission critical type of infrastructure, like a like like the the way I tell it to my team is that building an oracle is like building a spaceship, 
um, there's no room for error, right? Like if you, you know, if uh, you uh, have a bug on on a spaceship, right? You know, like people's lives could be lost, right? If you have a bug in an Oracle, right? You know, you could lead to billions of dollars just evaporating, right? So it's uh, it's one of those things where you really have to be very deliberate in how you design an Oracle, right? And from a from a DAP perspective, you have to be very deliberate in choosing the right Oracle, right? So yeah, maybe like you already mentioned one challenge here in, in running an Oracle, right? Like a lot is at stake. Uh, can you maybe dive deeper into, you know, some other challenges of, of running an Oracle? And then we, you know, go into like how Chronicle solves them, hopefully. Sure. Um, so, so I think the, the big trade-off that uh, every Oracle protocol has is this trade-off between kind of security and decentralization and cost. Um, and traditionally, the way this plays out is that uh, uh, you can, as an Oracle protocol, right, choose the number of validators that you have. Right? Do you have a lot of validators? Do you have a very small number of validators? And that will affect the uh, cost of the Oracle. And, and the, the cost of the Oracle right, is like a very important part of creating a sustainable Oracle product. Right, because of gas prices multiply, right? I, I think we've been very blessed with, uh, you know, nine guay, ten guay, fifteen guay kind of uh, average gas prices. But if you think back to even just a year and a half ago, right, two years ago, um, during the peaks of the bull market, right, uh, there was a day where we hit seven thousand guay, right? And uh, you know, can you imagine the costs, like the cost to operate your product, right, literally going up, you know. Uh, 500x right uh, that's uh, th that's incredibly difficult to deal with from a service provider perspective um, but also incredibly difficult to deal with right from a, a users of, uh, of oracles right uh, so typically what Oracle providers have kind of done is aired on the side of like okay smaller number of validators right um, kind of good enough security to kind of keep those costs in check right? Uh, not up, not updating the Oracle as frequently, right? If you do less updates of the Oracle, right, you can save on costs even more. And, and this, these are not real fixes, right? These are kind of just like band-aid fixes, right? Um, what you really need to do is kind of solve the underlying engineering problem of this linear relationship between the number of validators, right? And, uh, the costs of the transaction. And so I think that's, that's kind of what Chronicle kind of has solved. Um, you know, it's it's certainly not the entire Oracle problem, um, but it's a very, very significant chunk of it that was kind of holding back uh, the Oracle space. And and I, and I think that's that's what makes Chronicle quite uh, quite unique in that you know we have this constant time um, Oracle verification mechanism. So that means that you can have any number of validators, right? And the cost stays the, exactly the same. And uh, the the beautiful thing about this is that, like, uh, you know, we, we have some some incredibly smart people on the team who uh, who have some very good experience with with gas optimizing. Um, and so we've actually gotten the uh, the gas cost of an Oracle update. You know, again with any number of validators, right? Could be one, could be a hundred, could be a thousand. Um, we've got it down to 66,000 gas, which is, uh, to, to put that into perspective of, of how incredible that is, that is less than an ERC-20 transfer. The, the cheapest transaction you can do on Ethereum, right, is sending ETH to someone. That's 21,000 gas, right? This is the equivalent of, of three of those. Um, you know, when, when you compare this to, um, like, like to put this in reference to other Oracle protocols, uh, chain link with like 10 validators costs about 280,000 to 300,000 gas. So not only have we gotten this down to cost and time to have, you know, uh, a multiple of those number of validators, but we've even gotten the cost down like 80%, uh, compared to some of these other, uh, some of these other Oracle providers. So, so when you, when you say validators, I mean, I think a lot of people think of validators as, 
uh, network participants that are securing a chain in, in the context of, uh, say, a layer one, like Ethereum or an, or an app chain, what what does a validator look like in the context of Chronicle or like an, another, uh, like you mentioned, Chainlink also has validators. Like what, how, how are these participants um, interacting with the chain? What kind of infrastructure are they running? What are they securing exactly? So so I think the, the easiest way to um, think about oracles sometimes is um, like a good layer of abstraction is like a multi-sig, right? Uh, you have a certain number of, of signers, right? That's your validators. And uh, you need like a subset of those to reach consensus around something. Um, so in terms of what that looks like from the tech side, it's you get a bunch of, you know, uh, actors to, you know, hopefully that, you know, have uh, some kind of reputation attached to them um, to run a client. And uh, they essentially, right, have their own keys, right? Um, and uh, what they're doing is essentially querying all of the data, um, processing the data themselves, right? Uh, modeling it and then spitting out like an answer and being like, okay, ETHUSD, I think it's this, right? Um, and they sign that with their key and then they push it to um, kind of a peer-to-peer -peer layer. Um, and so now you kind of have like all of these uh, kind of gossiped price attestations kind of like floating around in like a big like primordial soup of like, uh, of, uh, you know, like attested to information. And now you can start aggregating all of those together, right? And once you have um, enough aggregated information, right, across enough participants to reach a quorum, Right now, this uh, this information can be can be pushed on chain to the oracle. The oracle will process all of the attested to data, right, and then publish that uh, publish that piece of data, right, or publish that that price. So typically, um, uh, it it's very very important, right, or or not. I, I shouldn't say typically. No, it is very very important that the validators you choose are very credible. Right, um, and and this is something that uh, you know uh, some protocols are very open about. Right, who is, who are the validators, or in the cases of some Oracle protocols, who is the validator? So in terms of Chronicle, right, uh, we we've kind of gone to this approach of saying, look, um, there is a whole ecosystem of DApps that people use every day. Right, uh, maybe you have a Gnosis safe. Uh, maybe you use matcha swap uh, to to trade, right? Uh, maybe you have like a uh, Argent mobile wallet, right? Um, maybe you use a uh, DeFi saver, right, to manage all of your DeFi positions. And so people have built up like an implicit trust um, into these protocols. And so who better to run the validators for an Oracle protocol powering DeFi than all of the you know actors in the ecosystem, all of these protocols themselves. So we have like so Chronicles validator set right consists of you know people like uh, Zero X Protocol or DYDX or Gitcoin, uh, Etherscan, Infura, um, Gnosis, and a handful of others, right? And and we want to keep expanding that that validator set and and kind of like what we're going for is that is we want to be able to go to the community and be able to say, here's an Oracle and you can trust it because it's very like powered by the community. Right. And, uh, even though, you know, in, in theory, right. You can always have an Oracle attack, right. You can always have the, the validators kind of try to do a malicious attestation, right. Uh, attesting to, to, uh, incorrect data. Um, it, it, it kind of in, in practice, if you have enough of the, uh, if you have a big enough validator set of all of the biggest actors in crypto, uh, you kind of just negate any, anything, uh, like that ever happening. Right. Because it would be like the industry kind of just like cannibalizing itself and like swallowing its own tail. So, um, our, our kind of mission, right. Is just to kind of onboard everyone that, you know, feels very strongly that we need to have like a truly decentralized Oracle, um, that, that we can, 
that we can, we all don't have to worry about you know this this oracle attack vector anymore and that that want to be a part of that and i would say you know come talk to us um let's add you let's uh, you know have you become a chronicle validator and uh you know you can even use chronicle yourself in your own protocol right and and dog food it yeah that's actually very interesting like speaking also from experience like running a chain link operator with coros and like sort of this model of where more the infrastructure providers are more like professional validators or like staking companies that run like infrastructure for on the daily basis versus like this model of letting the dApps run it and i think in pith actually a lot of their sort of validators i guess initially at least were like actually the data feed the providers that actually generate let's say the price data so literally the exchanges and things like that so i guess there's like different like participants you can choose can you maybe speak a bit about you know are there issues maybe with like um availability if if it's like run by you know people that don't run infrastructure as their core business or you know how how are you thinking about these things or or should you have like maybe validators from all these different constituents or, or, you know, I guess, yeah, curious to hear what you think. So, so I think you, you really want to just design a protocol that's resilient. Um, so, you know, the protocol is designed that it's fine if like a handful of validators go offline, right? It's, uh, it's, it's designed to expect that kind of scenario. Now in terms of like, uh, do we actually see that happening very often? No, not really. The, these protocols run an enormous amount of infrastructure internally, and they're they're very good at running infra, and they have entire you know DevOps teams to uh, to monitor this infra and, and keep everything online. So in, in practice, right, uh, we we don't really see that happening very often. Uh, they're they're very adept. Um, but what I would caution is like, why? Do people necessarily trust infrastructure companies as validators? Sure, they're good at running infra that stays online, but from a trust requirement, what like uh, like the the security of your oracle is relying on these entities that are your validators to be you know good honest actors that uh, you know the user either the DAP or you know the end user that's using the oracle or the end user of that DAP right that they have some kind of you know, trust relationship with. And I would argue that uh, these infrastructure companies are relatively unknown and they don't really have like a reputation for integrity. And uh, it it kind of seems strange to me that we would like, you know, build these like decentralized Oracle protocols and then outsource the security to uh, these like r- relatively unknown validators, right? That don't really have any reputation to to protect. What kind of like are you talking about like uh, node as a service company specifically or some other sort of of actor here? Um, so what what Felix was alluding to is that there's a ton of like um, like entities in the space that just run infrastructure, right? Maybe it's staking infrastructure, or maybe it's RPC infrastructure, or maybe it's just like hosting in general, or they just. Uh, run validators for a bunch of different chains, right? Yeah, like a like a Figment or a Chorus or a, you know, Kiln or any one of these companies, yeah. Sure. And so you you think that these companies have have generally low reputation and can't can't be trusted to run infrastructure? I I think as a user, you should be always questioning like who are the validators? Like that should be your first question when um trying to choose a a protocol, right? And uh, I I think it's quite clear that if you compare, you know, like the amount of implicit trust that a user has in, uh, you know, thought leaders in the space, like someone like Gnosis or, or DYDX or, or Gitcoin or Etherscan, right? That, uh, you know, that reputation and that need to protect that reputation by those, uh, by those different protocols is much higher than, you know, an infrastructure company that seems like are just spinning up by the dozen. Nobody really knows who they necessarily are. They're not very public facing. Um, and they could just kind of like spin up a, if, if they do, you know, uh, run into any reputational problems, right? They just rebrand, spin up a new entity somewhere else, right? And, uh, you know, back to business as normal. 
right? Um, there's the, the incentives like us being a validator, right? And being an honest validator, right? Are, are really tied to, do you have a reputation to protect? And, uh, in, in the case of many of these validators, right? Uh, I don't think they do. I mean, I don't know if I would fully agree with that. Uh, maybe you feel like you have a, a different uh, view on this. I mean, or certainly you have a view on this. this you know, you work for Force One, but I, I feel I feel like validator infrastructure companies do place a lot of at least in well from the perspective of like where I know infrastructure validator companies, right? So like uh, in Cosmos, we we have a lot of infrastructure companies that run infrastructure that run validators and, and other sorts of infrastructure, and they do place a whole lot of importance in their reputation, certainly through. Um, their involvement in in governance, um, being good stewards of the ecosystem uh, in terms of like contributing to open source software, et cetera. Like, sure, there are lots of maybe, you know, less reputable companies or individuals or like semi-professional validators that are running infra. But by and large, I feel like infrastructure companies, um, I mean, their business is right. So like their long-term uh, their long-term incentive is to build a company and so build, build reputation and, and maintain that reputation. Yeah. So, so I, I, I think in the end, the point that we can all agree on is that like the validator set matters, right? And, uh, that's absolutely for, yeah. for any Oracle protocol, right? From a technology perspective, right? You can, you can always fork the technology, but you can't fork the network. Right. And so the, the really differentiating factor that, uh, you will have as an Oracle protocol is like, you know, what is the value of your validator set, right? How expansive is it? Um, you know, what is the, like, you know, both the individual reputation and the aggregate reputation um, and the, the number of validators in this set, right? And, and that's really your, your moat, right? And that's why, you know, at Chronicle, we're kind of placing like a huge value on just, um, you know, onboarding more and more of these, of these highly credible validators. Yeah, I think it's really interesting this discussion for sure. I guess in in general, the the interesting thing I think for you guys in a way seems to be lying also in that the complexity of the protocol, or also like that it's possible to run potentially like relatively easily uh, for these other actors. Or like, can you maybe describe a bit? Because like I guess from experience, running a bunch of different networks at some point becomes uh, like a big issue and you have like you have to have to focus on that and obviously all these companies you're mentioning they have like products to build and like other things to focus on and i don't i wonder what i guess maybe because they're like building on this protocol they're they're running it and the oracle is important enough or maybe it's easy enough to run i guess um yeah curious to to hear how you are achieving that so from the validator perspective is um they're very they're they're blockchain agnostic, right? Remember earlier I was saying like, what does a validator or, or in Chronicle Lingo, what does a feed do? Um, they're just querying data, and then they're signing it and they're pushing it to this peer to peer pool, right? That's all they do, right? So they're not even interacting with um, a particular chain, right? So if Chronicle wants to expand to, you know, twenty, thirty different blockchains. Uh, it doesn't mean that the validator actually needs to run twenty or thirty different, you know, blockchain nodes, right? Um, they're 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 agnostic from from their point of view, and so that really limits the complexity of of what they need to run, right? Um, and so really, it's the um, relay kind of side of okay, taking all of this data from this peer to peer pool and pushing it on chain. Right and uh, and a relay only needs to support the chains that it wants to support, right? So if it just wants to do Polygon zk EVM, it can do that. If it wants to do Ethereum zk EVM and um, I don't know something like uh, Mantle or, or Base Chain, right? It 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 can do that. Right. So there's like actually a second sort of role with the relay, more or less, and then you have to. I, I guess yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and then. In terms of the fee model, or like I guess business model, which is I think in the Oracle space, generally quite a interesting topic, since you know a lot of the protocols run on these oracles, uh, a lot of value rides on them, but kind of 
no one wants to pay for it, <laughs> more or less. So you sort of have to finance it or like, and uh, yeah, I would be curious to hear your thoughts, how, how is Chronicle thinking about this, how you feel this play out in the future also. Is it ever always going to stay as it is right now that it needs to be like sort of subsidized or um, yeah, how do you, where do you see this going? I, I think that's an amazing question uh be, because it's uh it's so creative like what we what we do in the oracle space so after kind of uh going through the right we, we talked earlier about right in the bull market you had these uh these crazy high gas prices right and the oracle protocols who were not making any money right were just kind of like bleeding vc cash right had were spending millions of dollars a year just on the gas right and so all, everyone kind of collectively noticed, oh, well, this is not sustainable, right? Um, and, and started introducing those measures that we talked about earlier, right? You know, reducing the number of validators, right? To make the transaction cost cheaper, reducing the frequency with which the, the Oracle updates, um, all to try to kind of keep the cost down. And so um, in particular, when it comes to like monetizing Oracles, I, I, I think there's a pretty clear path to monetization, right? Uh, in terms of just a subscription, right? It's an Oracle as a service, right? And uh, you can pay on some cadence, right? Either uh, on a monthly, you can have some kind of monthly deal, an annual deal, I don't know, per block, right? Um, to have access to this Oracle. So, so that part's not very complicated. Um, I think what is kind of complicated is like the meta game uh, surrounding like the um, constantly changing context of the uh, the crypto macro environment, right? So, you know, you can imagine right during the bull market, right when uh, VCs are funding a bunch of companies, right? Uh, all of these uh, companies or protocols, right, have a lot of cash, right? Uh, they're very much willing to pay um, the you know sometimes exorbitant costs of of these oracles. You look at kind of the current environment, right, uh, where you know the VC funding market is, has been rather tight, and you're seeing teams and protocols needing to you know tighten up the belt, right? Uh, you're seeing them do things like layoffs, right, to extend their runway, and they really are looking for a way to like reduce costs, right? And uh, uh, one of those areas that they look at is is oracles, right? And so um, there's kind of two interesting effects I think we've seen in the the past year uh so one is oracle protocols protocols kind of recognizing that their potential customers don't necessarily have the money to pay for this stuff and the oracle protocol may or may not have the uh the capital right to to subsidize uh this like in the red for for some period of time and so um what, what you really saw was this pro proliferation of like pull oracles which were, um, right, so instead of the Oracle protocol pushing the data to this Oracle and now someone can just use the Oracle, it becomes the protocol itself that is using the Oracle that is like doing the actual push updates to the Oracle, right? So still using the same data from the validators, it's just uh, instead of the Oracle protocol pushing it, right, it's the, 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 uh, the protocol that's using the Oracle. But what's really happening is that what the protocol that's using the Oracle protocol will do is offload that cost to their users, right? Um, so like, like if you use a protocol, right, uh, it's almost like a hidden tax. Like you get a Oracle update like bundled into your transaction, right? And as a user, you may or may not even know that uh, you're paying for this, right? And so um, from an Oracle provider perspective, this is attractive because now you don't have to have this volatility in gas prices, which is determining if you're like in the green or in the red. Um, from a DAP point of view, it's great because you're getting oracles, but you're not actually paying for them. Um, and then from the user perspective, kind of you're getting screwed, but you maybe don't even know it. Um, so, so I and then from a marketing perspective, this is all kind of dressed up as like. It's an on-demand Oracle, you know, there's no wasted updates. It only, the Oracle only updates what, exactly when a user wants to like use your protocol, right? Like it's seen as very like 
uh, no waste or something. Um, but it's mostly just marketing spin, right? Um, it's really just a way for everyone to kind of like just be like, pass the buck around in terms of I'm not paying for that, right? Um, and then the the second, well, and, and I, I will say like a little personal remark, I think this is very short-sighted. Um, I think in the startup world, typically the business model is you want to subsidize the costs that your users or your customers have um, to uh, to accelerate growth, right? Um, if you look at you know the early days of Uber, right, they were using VC cash to sell you rides, right, for less than it cost them, right, and that's how you bootstrap product market fit for a for a new product, right. Uh, same thing with all of these like food delivery apps, right? Uh, they got a lot of traction because at the beginning they were really cheap. And now that they're charging you for the actual cost, right? Everyone's like, why am I paying $40 for like delivery of a pizza and like some some cheesy bread or something, right? Um, and, and this is like the antithesis of that, right? This is like these pull oracles are like you're adding like a tax to those users, right? And while maybe at the current gas prices, it's not very noticeable, when gas prices start to um, increase again, and they will, uh, when you start getting back to 100, 200, 300 guay, um, it's really going to start to cannibalize uh, the user base of these protocols because the users are just going to be like, this is too expensive to use, right? It's the cost to use this protocol is more than the utility than, that I'm getting from it. Right, and so so I think uh, these these pull oracles are kind of like a, a forbidden fruit in in that sense, and that it, it seems like a like a magical solution with no downside, but uh, it's um, it it can be very dangerous um, kind of going forward. And and so the the, the second I, I did mention that there's two kind of uh, things that we've seen change in the meta. The the second one is that uh, oracle protocols have gone from. Um, you know, uh, after having this realization of saying, well, the dApps themselves don't necessarily have the money to pay for oracles. Who has money right now? And they look at like all of these new chains, right? They look at all of the L2s, they look at all of the uh, the ZK rollups, the optimistic rollups, the uh, maybe alternative layer ones, right? Um, and they, they, you know, they acknowledge that like, this is what money has been shoveled into in the past few years. You know, these uh, chains are very cash and token rich, um, but and need but don't have necessarily have an ecosystem, and they need to spend money to bootstrap that ecosystem. And so, it's actually much easier, right, to go to chains and to sell them on the Oracle services and being and being, you know, rightfully so, saying that look, you want to start up an ecosystem. Um, but uh, all of these dApps on your chain are going to need oracles and they're going to have to bear those costs, right? And so if you want to be like a, a catalyst for um, for teams being able to build on your chain, right, uh, you should uh, pay for the oracles uh, yourselves, right? And so essentially the chains become the customers and the dApps that are using the Oracle become the users, right? So it's interesting that you have like this user customer kind of kind of split. Um, ultimately, I, I don't think the chains want to be in this position where they are permanently kind of paying for Oracle infrastructure. So so I don't think it long term it makes sense anyway. Um, but but in the end, right? Uh, someone is always deriving value from the Oracle, and so someone will be willing to pay for it. Right. Uh, ultimately, I do think that will be the DApps uh, once they do find uh, find traction. Now, I want to ask you about um, the, uh, the the use of Oracles in, in app chains. I, I don't know to what extent you follow this, but uh, in say like in a Cosmos SDK chain, uh, there there has been some there have been some uh, changes to uh, essentially the. The, the protocol where the the uh, consensus talks to the application it's this protocol called ABCI and um, and so validators are now able to uh, effectively add Oracle data price feed data in their blocks and the uh, other validators in the cons in consensus also vote on this data along with the block information and so 
if effectively what this means is that app chains can now kind of run their own oracles. They can sort of like ask their validators to provide price feed data and, and not have to rely on an external third party service. Is this something you guys are thinking about? And how do you see the use of oracles and, you know, Ethereum smart contracts versus rollups versus, you know, app chains? Sure. So, so I think what's important like to, uh, to convey, right. Is that, uh, as an Oracle provider, you don't like, I have my own personal views of like, you know, what chains or, you know, or, uh, kind of, uh, chain types I'm, I'm bullish on or, or bearish on. Um, but as an Oracle provider, right, we don't really make those kind of bets, right. In terms of, uh, who will succeed or who will lose. You kind of just try to support everybody, right? So it doesn't matter, right? Who, who wins and loses, right? Um, so, uh, from that perspective, right, uh, you always want to think of Oracle protocols from like a general mechanism point of view. Um, like what is an implementation that basically is general purpose that scales across every chain, right? Every user base, every ecosystem of dApps that is out there. And so, so I definitely do think that there are, um, interesting synergies like within, um, certain chain ecosystems, right? Like, uh, in terms of like, uh, what you mentioned, right. With Cosmos IBC, right. Uh, validators being able to, uh, to send and attest to data. Right. Um, in the EDM world, right. You can, uh, you have like these native message bridges, um, and there's interesting applications that you can do on those like specific chains or on those specific chain types. Um, but as an Oracle provider, like you really want to stay as, as general as possible and just kind of, um, support one implementation because the, the moment you start to try to support multiple different implementations, um, things start to get really dangerous. Um, the context of different chains in terms of how their environments work and what like the, the gotchas are in terms of, you know, even simple things like overflows and, and underflows or, um, the implementation, like you can have, uh, for example, multiple, uh, EVM chains, right. That say that they're all EVM. But under the hood, um, the implementation is different, right? And uh, if you're not aware of these minute differences, uh, you can really get yourself into trouble. And so you really want to have one implementation that you're extremely confident in, right? That you can devote kind of your entire security budget to, to auditing, to doing, uh, right? Bounties, um, pen testing, um, rather than this dangerous game of like, oh, well, we have this Oracle that's specific for Cosmos and we have this one that's specific for Solana and we have this one that's specific for EVM and we have this one that's specific for like the move based, uh, ecosystem of chains and, uh, and right. Uh, starting to like port, uh, features, right. And implementing them like multiple times across all of these implementations. It's a, it's a recipe for disaster. And so while, while we would love to take advantage of some of these like uh, really unique and really powerful primitives of these chains. Um, the, the game theory calculus just doesn't really play out that way. And we have to think much more, much more general. So let, let's talk about the, the, the technical aspects of Chronicle a little bit. So you, you leverage Schnorr signatures. So maybe it, uh, and we wanted to talk a little bit about how, how you're using Schnorr, uh, but maybe, uh, first we could, uh, uh, start by just reminding, getting a reminder of like what are Schnorr signatures, how different they are from ESCSA, and uh, maybe you could lead, use that to lead into how uh, you're you're leveraging Schnorr in the signing scheme. Sure. Uh, so Schnorr signatures are a signature aggregation scheme. Uh, so that is to say, um, you can have one signature that is representative of multiple signatures. Um, and so, uh, you know, in, co in contrast to, um, ECDSA where you have like, it's like a one-to-one -one relationship, right? One validator signed, you know, attests and it generates one signature. And so if you have N validators, you have N signatures, uh, with short signatures, you can have N validators and it always ends up as one signature. And 
what's like incredibly powerful about this property, right, is that uh, um, it leads to an enormous amount of data compression. Um, and when you look at uh, some of the constraints of, uh, of, of, of blockchains, Right, uh, the amount of data is is one of the primary drivers of of cost. Right, uh, if if you look at the composition of what a transaction on layer two costs, um, the innovation of layer twos is that compute is incredibly cheap. But data, like uh, the the data that you pass to a, a smart contract, is incredibly expensive. And the reason for that is because all of that data needs to be essentially push to a data availability layer like Ethereum layer one uh, so that uh, right in in the event of uh, you know like fraud that all of those transactions can be replayed right and and provably you know you can prove that whether fraud or, or not existed right in in the case of in the case of these rollups so um, if you can compress the data uh, in uh, the way that store signatures do, right? You get enormous, enormous cost reductions on on layer two for uh, for for using short signatures, and so that was that's kind of like the primary driver of the uh, of the gas savings that we did, right? That allows us to have like these eighty to ninety percent gas savings compared to some of these other Oracle protocols. Awesome. I think we also could still go into, I guess, the the optimistic. Sort of verification and and how this challenge protocol works at another time potentially since we're we're already quite quite deep in the episode. Um, but maybe like more interestingly for the listeners that um, you know are potentially working on projects and want to integrate oracles themselves, can you uh, uh, maybe expand? You know where Chronicle like sort of is deployed right now, or like where can people use Chronicle? data and you know what sort of data do you have available at this point and kind of what are you working towards is it you know is it just ETH? if is, is is it going to like other directions um i think that would be a good place to to sort of start wrapping it up so uh in terms of chains that uh we support today um we uh we we launched this new um kind of oracle architecture uh with with this uh with this short signature innovation uh, we, we just recently launched this on Ethereum uh, mainnet and on Polygon ZK VM, but we're effectively doing like a layer two strategy where we're just going to be onboarding like all of the layer twos, right? So when it comes to, you know, uh, any, anything really that, uh, that, that you've, you've heard of, right? In terms of uh, what like Arbitrum, uh, Optimism, uh, Mantle, uh, base chain, right? Um, even even something like Gnosis chain, uh, we're going to be onboarding uh, these types of layer twos incredibly quickly, right? So I, I would expect by the end of the year, right, uh, we'll we'll basically be supporting all of the uh, all of the main ones. So um, you know, I would encourage you to to reach out to us, right? Uh, go to our website, chroniclelabs.org. Um, and uh, from there, right, you can uh, you can find our Discord, you can find our Twitter, right. Uh, get in touch with us. Um, you know, let us know what uh, what you need, and uh, we can we can get you set up. Um, in terms of you know what we what we offer, right. Um, I, I think there's an enormous amount of product market fit, right, in DeFi for price oracles, right. So uh, we we definitely offer this, but really like our oracles are built to be generalized, right? So we can do any kind of data, right? So we're even delving into like the RWA space and uh, doing like real world attestations of like, you know, even assets that are held by custodians, right? In a, in a bank, right? So uh, we can, we can get really crazy with it. Um, and it's all backed by, by the same underlying, you know, secure Oracle architecture, right? That is uh, securing like the billions of dollars a maker. Let's maybe just spend, a, if you don't mind, a few minutes talking about the real world asset stuff because I think that's probably one of the things that uh, a lot of people are interested in. And certainly, it's one of the areas that is highly anticipated in terms of bringing more liquidity and more value onto blockchains. Uh, can you can you talk a little bit more about the, some of the work that you're doing there and why you're so uh, bullish on on real world assets? Sure, and I should probably preface this by saying I'm I'm bullish on 
real world assets in a in a very narrow context. Um, like I'm I'm going to a lot of uh, conferences at the moment on panels about RWA, and there's a lot of people pretending or saying talking about some far flung future. Um, wh- when I'm when I'm talking about real world assets, I'm talking about what they look like right now um, in terms of the product market fit that they have achieved right now. Um, so the the context here is right that uh, uh, you have this divergence of rates between the real world and between DeFi because in traditional finance, right, uh, rates are driven by monetary policy, right, and uh, and to an extent liquidity, and uh, in DeFi, rates are driven by speculative demand for number go up, um, and so number has not gone up for quite some time. Uh, people are relatively bearish and so yields in DeFi are very low and so uh, this prompted um, a lot of um, protocols in DeFi with very large treasuries right or you know uh, credit protocols like MakerDAO uh, to look elsewhere right to effectively say look at the calculus of saying like well if we loan DAI on chain we can get 1.75 percent we can get two percent or we can loan die off chain, right, and get like five, six, seven, eight percent. And so I think MakerDAO was very early in recognizing this and, and making moves. And so at this point, I think cumulatively, uh, MakerDAO has allocated something like between two and, or I think that was like three at this point, three billion dollars into uh, different real world assets, uh, predominantly uh, treasury bills, right? Because treasury bills are a very safe um, asset, right? That if, as long as you don't have liquidity problems, you can just kind of hold to maturity and earn like a, a very, very high yield, right? On the order of five plus percent. Um, and so, you know, from the perspective of Chronicle, right? When we look at real world assets, we're really look, we're really building for what we see, uh, where we see like the pain points today, right? Uh, Maker is kind of not just talking about real world assets or planning to do them in the future, right? Uh, Maker is doing them right now at scale. Like, and if you think about what is the entire real world asset market in terms of like capital delegated, I, I think Maker probably has somewhere between like eighty to ninety percent market share at the moment, right? And so we're uh, we we obviously work we're the oracle for Maker, right? We work very closely with Maker to. To solving the problems, and so you know, we we think we're going to have like a very big piece of um, the actual practical side of real world assets, and then use our practical experience right to expand that right and offer those services to everyone trying to get into real world assets. Because uh, I I think uh, very few people understand like the boots on the ground problems associated with real world assets, um, and it fundamentally boils down to that protocols right on blockchains, right, don't really have any insight to what's happening off chain. Um, and they have very few kind of recourse mechanisms off chain, right? Uh, maybe you have like a foundation that can serve as a legal entity as the face, but they are not the protocol, right? So the, the, it's very difficult for a protocol to act like autonomously in, in the real world. And so especially when it comes to credit delegation, Right, uh, you know, what recourse do you have when someone runs off with your money? That is like the big question when it comes to credit delegation. And so the the pain point here for a real world asset is how do you how does a protocol delegate, you know, something on the scale of billions of dollars into a um, real world type of infrastructure where it doesn't necessarily have the same capacity, right? For uh, liquidating, you know, in the next block, like it does on chain. And so, uh, really, what you have to do is like deconstruct, like, uh, what does this web of entities look like in the real world to create a real world asset? And typically, you'd have something like a trust, which is kind of like uh, the representative of the the protocol in the real world. So you can kind of have the trust be subservient to messages from that have been ratified by a DAO, right? By by governance, so the the protocol would extend, you know, the the money to this trust, right? The trust then interacts with the broker, right? Uh, what securities or structured products 
are you trying to buy, right? Uh, so you could have a broker, right? Like someone like Block Tower, um, or uh, I, I think in the past, someone like Genesis before they before they blew up. So the broker, right, will buy and sell, you know, wh whatever uh, you, whatever kind of structured products or, or securities you you want to purchase, right? And then you have a custodian, right? And the custodian is frequently someone like like a bank, right? And then you may have like an auditor, right, who is like auditing the uh, the activities of uh, what what the bank has in custody, or maybe auditing the activities of the broker, right? And so individually. You don't want any. You don't want to trust any of the data that any of these different actors kind of report because they kind of all have moral hazard, right? Uh, if uh, you know, maker turns off the tap in terms of credit delegation, right? Uh, all of them will not make any more money, right? And the party's over, right? Um, so you don't want to trust any of them individually, but as a as a set you can kind of overlap and like phase shift all of their individual reporting on top of each other in a real time kind of automated fashion and then you can actually derive a uh, like a high confidence in the consensus of what actually is in the real world and and give uh, that representation on chain in the form of an oracle right so in terms of the messages like of instructions that maker governance gave to the trust right those should be those should be symmetrical with the orders that the trust gives to the broker, right? Uh, those instructions that were given to the broker, right, should be symmetrical with the actual purchase and sell orders that the broker executed, right? Uh, with respect to what the bank holds in custody, those should be symmetric to what the, the broker, uh, you know, confirmed, right, that they purchased and sold, right? Same thing with the data that the auditor is reporting. Right, and so as you collectively aggregate all of this information, you can confine, you can determine what the kind of consensus view is in a in a decentralized fashion, and so now you can have this data on chain. Um, but what's interesting here is it's not necessarily price that is um, that is the most interesting, right? Um, you may be interested in you know what is the yield of this RWA bucket. Uh, you may be interested in, you know, what is the um, what is the, like the term of a lot of these securities, right? Especially if you're holding like uh, treasury bills, right? Uh, treasury bills mature, right? And then what do you do? Do you like roll those back into new treasury bills, or do you say, hey, you know, we want to have some more liquidity in the maker protocol, right? Let's recall some of that some of that money. Yeah, in blockchain, we kind of take those sort of granted because that data is usually available on chain or right, like right in the contract. You, you may be interested in the composition of the portfolio with respect to exposure to certain sectors or certain types of securities, right? And so now, once you have all of this data on chain, uh, the protocol can react in like an automated fashion, right? It can like extend more credit, or it can you know cut off credit. Uh, it can determine oh, well, this bucket that we have over here in real world assets is generating significantly more yield than this one. Let's reallocate some of that capital to here, right? And so it, it enables this enormous amount of like automation that, uh, that crypto protocols are kind of known for, but now in a real world context. And I think that's extremely powerful and that can be applied, you know, in a general case at scale to way more things than what we see today, right, which is just treasury bills, right? And it can be expanded to way more context than, right, just uh, DeFi protocols exp uh, extending credit, right? In, in this case, a real world asset oracle is really this bridge from piping in um, data from the outside world onto a blockchain. So now we can kind of achieve this cross automation. And that's where the real the real value is going to be. It's not going to be that DeFi replaces traditional finance or traditional finance like, you know, kills DeFi. It's going to be this hybrid system where they um, both both of those realms are able to interact and leverage the the strengths of the other. I think that's a great note to end on. Thanks, uh, thanks for for expanding on uh, on real world assets. I think it's it's one of the things that I'm really hopeful that we'll, we'll start coming into, uh, you know, DeFi protocols, right. Where, you know, you can open up 
say something like a like an Ave or 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 Uniswap and and be able to to swap like your USDC or your ETH for like Treasury bills, for instance. Um, I think that 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 will be a huge a huge accomplishment for the space if that were to happen. Um, Nicholas, thanks so much for coming on and uh, and expanding our minds about Oracles and Chronicle and all the important work you guys are doing. And uh, hopefully, we can get you back on at some point in the future. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been really great, guys. Thank you.